everyone knows about barcodes, right? They are everywhere. You go to a store, there's a barcode so that the cashier can tell what thing you have bought and how much to charge you. If you go to a warehouse, you have a barcode outside the package. If you order from Amazon or from Libris in Sweden, uh, they will know what the book is inside based on your barcode. Uh, we want to um, use that same concept, but for biology. So we want to use a barcode based on DNA to tell what is inside viruses, um, or to identify viruses, to identify bacteria, and to characterize cancer cells. Right? And there are already uh, plenty of techniques to do that, but they have all sorts of drawbacks. For example, to characterize bacteria, you often culture them, but that takes a lot of time. Some, some bacteria are even impossible to culture. Uh, some take a few days, some take a few weeks. We have to wait days to weeks to, to, to obtain the identity of these bacteria. Um, for cancer, uh, you could use uh, various ways to, to characterize the DNA. Um, you could use sequencing, but the problem is in many cases of cancer, what you are looking for is really the long-range changes in the DNA. Um, and in sequencing, what you do is that you cut the DNA into very small pieces and you sequence each small piece. And then in the computer, you put them together again uh, into a long sequence. But then, because you cut the DNA in many small pieces, um, you lose the long-range information that's important uh, to, to characterize the cancer cells. So uh, the way we do it <coughs> is that we essentially select the cell of interest, then we pull out the DNA from that individual cell and look at that individual DNA molecule. And then we put that DNA molecule into a nanochannel, and I brought here a nanochannel, um, you cannot see it, obviously, but it's in this package, the nanochannel. So here, here are the nanochannels. All right. So these are very small. Afterwards, you can come here and have a look at them. They are beautiful. And what happens then is that when the DNA goes in there, it's stretched out. You don't need to do anything with it. You don't need to pull it or anything. You just put it in there, and due to the confinement, it's stretched out, and this means that you can directly visualize. <coughs> sorry, this means that you can directly visualize the information along the DNA, right? And this means that you don't need any culturing because it, it, it's sufficient to have one cell and extract the DNA from that cell and observe that that DNA. You don't need any PCR amplification, um, and this gives an opportunity to study microorganisms that are difficult to culture and. Uh, even those microorganisms that are impossible to culture. Right? And, and that's very important for, for infectious disease, for cancer. You can have access to long-range information along the DNA. That's very difficult to, to access using uh, standard techniques. So why do you need nano for this? I said that if you confine the DNA into these small channels, it will be stretched out. The reason for that is, um, let's see, I can... I can use a metaphor, if you think about spaghetti, if you have a big pile of spaghetti for your lunch, and you squeeze this pile of spaghetti, you know, then the spaghetti will go to the side. If you squeeze it also from the other side, from two sides, then the spaghetti will be stretched out. Right? This is exactly what happens uh, with DNA in these small channels. The spaghetti doesn't like each other, it, doesn't, it cannot overlap. Right? The DNA doesn't like uh, uh, different parts of itself. Um, so you have something that's called excluded volume, and uh, this means that if you push DNA, it will be stretched out. And the length scale that describes the mechanical properties of the DNA is on the order of uh, 10 to 100 nanometers. And this means that you need channels on that same length scale. Okay, to realize this, we face uh, several challenges. One very important is that the DNA that we target is very long. If you look at bacterial DNA, it's one millimeter long. So that's very long compared to you know, the microscopic picture of nanochannels. Uh, if you look at the DNA from one human cell, it's two meters long. And the second challenge is that this 
long DNA, because of its length, it's very fragile. So you need to protect it as much as you can. And one way to do that, um, we have developed here, is that we embed the cells into very small droplets made of agarose. Agarose is a gel, and uh, it will keep the DNA in a protective uh, cushion, if you want. And you can see here to the left, down here to the left, we have one bacterium here trapped in uh, one of these agarose beads. Now we can treat the bacterium with chemicals that will lyse the bacterium, um, disintegrate its, its membrane, its proteins, etc. And then what will be remaining is the DNA. And then we can use electrophoresis, as you can see in the middle lower uh, movie here. We can use electrophoresis to pull out the DNA. Right. And then once we have done that, we can put it in a nanochannel that is meandering, and we can fit, uh, in this particular case, one millimeter of DNA in one nanochannel in one field of view. So now we can observe the DNA. Of course, here you don't see any information along the DNA. You just see the DNA, and it's long. Right. To get information from the DNA, you need to label it in one way or the other that reflects the, the underlying sequence. So one very simple method that we developed is um, localized melting. And the way it works is the following. So if you look at DNA, it consists of AT base pairs and GC base pairs. The AT base pairs are quite weak because they are held together with two hydrogen bonds and the GC base pairs are stronger because they are held together with three hydrogen bonds. So if you increase the temperature just a little bit, then um, you can choose a temperature where mainly the AT-rich regions are melted, but not the GC-rich regions. Right? And then you have a long DNA, which is melted in some parts and not melted in, in other parts. Now you need a dye that uh, is fluorescent where the DNA is not melted. And a, a standard dye can easily be found, and we use something that's called yo-yo, and it intercalates into the DNA, and uh, the DNA, um, where the DNA is double-stranded, this dye will shine brightly, and where the DNA is not um, double-stranded, where it's uh, uh, melted, the, DNA, uh, the dye will not bind and it will not shine brightly. So the result is here in this very small movie here. Let me start that one. You see a long DNA molecule here, um, and you can see that it's a bit spotty along its length. Right? It's, it's bright, and then it's dark, and bright, and dark. To, to better see it, we take a full movie of it, and then we display the movie as a function of time. So you can see here, and here we have our barcode. Right? So we have a barcode made of DNA, and this barcode represents the identity of the DNA. So now we can try to use it. So you remember the really long molecule that I showed in the meandering channel. Um, on the bottom of this slide, you see uh, the corresponding barcode of that l very long molecule. Uh, you also remember the viruses. Uh, you saw all these viruses, and these are phages. They attack bacteria, and you see this bacterium is really seriously attacked by a large number of viruses. Uh, there are many different types of these phages, um, and they look almost the same. But if you look at the DNA, if you look at the barcode of the DNA, you can see at the right there, uh, you see that the barcodes are very, very different. You don't even need a computer to see the difference between these barcodes. So we can use the barcodes to identify viruses. But what may be even more useful is to identify bacteria. So we have started with that and we looked at fragments from individual bacteria or from bacteria and uh, we extracted the barcode information from each of these fragments. And uh, you re remember these bacteria. And if you take the DNA from these bacteria and fit them to the theoretical barcode based on the known sequence, of Streptococcus pneumoniae, pneumococcus. Uh, they cause pneumonia, among other things. Uh, you can see that the fragments, and you see all here, these are all fragments here, 
and they fit very nicely to the theory which is up here. So this opens up for identifying bacteria just by looking at the, the DNA and just by looking at the barcode that we can create along the DNA that is a representation of the underlying sequence. So this opens up very nice future prospects, maybe with a time horizon of five to ten years, uh, for ultra-fast microbial identification. Right? Instead of taking a sample from the patient and then sending it for culturing and waiting several days or, or even weeks, here we have an opportunity to just take the DNA immediately from the cells of interest inside the sample from the patient and observe the barcode, just like in the store, right? and immediately you know what disease the patient has. Right? And this also opens up for, for interesting um, opportunities in cancer genomics, because there you, you, you are really interested in the long-range structure of the genome. And here is one example of that. This is not from cancer, but this is from yeast. And you see a highly repetitive uh, structure of the genome. You can never capture this repetitive structure using standard sequencing, but using our method we can do that. So overall, we have created a method that can give us better targeted and more timely uh, treatments for very severe disease. Thank you. So, thank you. We'll get rid of cancer then, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Who has any, yeah? So I realize that you can, dis you can uh, see if it's an AT or a GC region, but maybe this is not relevant, but can you see if it's an A or a T? No, 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 this is a, um, I'm sorry, I, I went very quickly there in, in one crucial slide here. Uh, the resolution is about 1 KB. So what we are looking at is essentially the average composition of that 1 KB. There was someone there, yeah? <clears throat> yeah, I'm just curious, this is very elegant. I'm just curious in the example you showed with the barcode, the sort of what you look for at the top, there was one mismatch. And do you have any? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's one very outstanding mismatch. Do you have any right. theory for that yeah. one? Oh, this one? Yeah, yes. from the right, 20 25%, there is a mismatch. And what's that? Uh, where is the. Oh, there. No? Oh, yes, right. So this is a large dark area. And um, this goes into the details because the DNA also breaks up when you look at it. We are working on that. So we think we can, we can avoid that. But sometimes it happens. And then you have large dark areas which are not representative of melted DNA, but of no DNA. And that might confuse this, this matching. So it's so fragile that it breaks at this point. Right. But then also these bacteria evolve. So if you take the official sequence of some bacterium and then take the actually cultured bacterium, there's no, there's no uh, guarantee that this cultured bacterium that you get in your test tube is really the exactly same sequence as the one that you get in the sequence database. <clears throat>